everyone in this room has had biomaterials or bioengineered bio solutions in or on their bodies. From contact lenses, degradable sutures, maybe dental implants, hopefully not hip implants, <laughs> time release medication, and dental fillings. And during the past couple thousand years, we've actually seen biomaterials being used in medicine. From dentistry applications, using wood and glass, eyes, and since the advent of synthetic materials, we've really seen major advances in the treatment of patients. If you take a look at how some of the early materials were used in medicine, you may be quite surprised. These materials were taken directly off the shelf. We see materials from ladies' girdles, sausage casing, clothing, and even mattress stuffing that was used early in medicine. And in 1975, the Society for Biomaterials formed, and research then was really focused on the biocompatibility of materials, really the passiveness of materials. And by 1987, a biomaterial was still being defined in a relatively passive manner as a non-viable material used in a medical device intended to interact with biological systems. And I think that this really reflected the state of the field, which was focused on coatings of, of implants to try to prevent rejection and prevent infection. But since the 90s, something really exciting happened. We saw the convergence of multiple disciplines, materials, fabrication, drug delivery, stem cells, electronics, and bioengineering departments started popping up across the world. This was really the first time where there was infrastructure in place for people to communicate consistently and constantly uh, between departments. And this led to the emergence of designer materials that I think are really beginning to revolutionize medicine and have impacted everybody. And despite all these great technologies that we've seen, I think basic discoveries are still not being exploited to the extent that they could be. We still, ha still have no cures for many diseases, including cancer, and I would argue that we need more convergence. What's amazing is that if you look at the time that it takes to change the world, what we see is in the past, it took centuries. If you look to the present, it's really on the order of years, the time it takes for people to come together and through the connectivity that we have with the internet uh, and travel, we're able to come up with ideas and really change the world within a matter of years. Think of technologies that you use, including Uber, uh, including um, the iPhone, including you know, all kinds of different techs, tech, technologies like that. But the challenge is, is that if we look at medicine, the time it ch takes to change the world has really remained stagnant. And this is that the clinical development has really not changed. On order, it takes on average about 10 to 12 years from the time that uh, one would start a development process, do some research, identify a target, and then take this through clinical trials. And so it's really important that we advance the best possible technologies that we have available um, and choose them right, right from the beginning. And I think to change the world in medicine, we really need a new approach, a new integrated approach to biomedical research, a new blueprint for innovation. And I think one solution is to try to make interactions between basic scientists, clinicians, and bioengineers seamless, to provide them access to state-of-the-art tools and technologies, and really try to be pointed always in the right direction to help patients. And the next three speakers that you're going to see here are all from the biomedical engineering department at the Brigham. Uh, their careers have really focused entirely on convergence. They epitomize convergence. 
And we have a great lineup. Uh, we have Aaron Goldman, who's going to be discussing math in medicine. Uh, Natalie Artsy, who will be discussing precision materials in medicine. And Orrin Levy, who will be describing uh, stem cells in medicine. So without further ado, I would like to call up uh, Aaron Goldman to tell us about math in medicine. Uh, well, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to present and the organizers. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of our projects in our lab. And this is really focused on mathematics, but primarily computational biology um, and how we can understand uh, the treatment of disease, specifically cancer. So I want to tell you first a little bit background. Uh, why, you know, why are we studying this? What are some of the lingering questions that we're trying to address? Uh, primarily, why is cancer therapy not always successful? If you look at the trends over the past century, it's not as dramatic um, as we would have expected with some of the advances that we've made. What are the mechanisms, molecular mechanisms, biological mechanisms that drive resistance to therapy, one of the impediments to any successful treatment? And third, what are the strategies that we can then develop, informed by all of our discoveries, to better treat cancer and therefore prevent relapse? So why do I say relapse is something that we need to address in cancer? And first of all, let's take a look at breast cancer as one example. Uh, successful treatment of breast cancer um, will, quote unquote, successful, will often lead to relapse, meaning regrowth of the tumor, in 20 to 40 percent of the cases, depending on the subtype. What's important to note is that the overall five-year survival before a patient relapses is fairly significant, 80 percent. Once a patient relapses, that five-year survival is diminished almost completely. And so to address the therapies of failure is really penultimate to curing at least breast cancer in this, in this one case. So one of the major challenges that we began to address in the past decade or two is our understanding of heterogeneity in cancer. Of course, there's a lot of intertumoral heterogeneity between people. But even within a single cancer, within a single tumor, there's a lot of heterogeneity between the cells. And even within a cell, you can have differences in the genetic and phenotypic makeup between the cell right next door to it. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to simplify this in, in one way. So let's say we take the heterogeneity, we look at a tumor, and we can stratify this into really two different uh, sensitivities. One type of cell is going to be a chemotherapy sensitive cell on the left, and we typically refer to these as non-cancer stem cells, put it into that hierarchy, whereas on the other spectrum we have a chemotherapy resistant cancer cell, and this is what we typically refer to as cancer stem cells. So what I'm going to tell you about today is a third cell state, and this is a third cell state that we identified using computational biology, using mathematics to understand the complexity of tumors. So we started this very simply, and we used uh, primary human tumors from a breast cancer patient who's refractory, meaning they're insensitive to treatment, treated with chemotherapy in the laboratory, and we began to look at what cells are we left with at the end of the day. And what we found is that in addition to a few of these cancer stem cell phenotypes, we found a third cell phenotype that seemed to pop up for us every time. And instead of just passing that to the side and saying, oh, it's a derivation of a cancer stem cell, we began questioning a little bit more because once we removed therapy, they would go away and the tumor would come back just like it had previously in the same heterogeneity that we saw before treatment. So this is why we turn to computational biology, because you can't just understand this complexity experimentally. When you're dealing with such a, a huge system, uh, you have to turn to something where we can simplify that, and we simplified that in terms of math. So these are, this is just an example of, of uh, um, some of the equations that we developed with a lab in Canada. Um, who's, he's a physicist, his name's Mohamed Kohandel, and his uh, uh, medical student, Andrew Dewan, who did a uh, uh, majority of this work, develop models, mathematical models, where we can investigate not just the proliferation rates of the cells, but now we can also investigate the switching of cell states. And we can do this for S stem cells and non-stem cells, and I, this induced population, this new cell state. And deriving all of these differential equations gives us uh, sort of a peek into the complexity of cell phenotypes over time in a heterogeneous tumor. 
And what we were able to spit out from a simulation, a mathematical simulation, was that before chemotherapy, cells are in a, uh, um, a flux, and they're constantly dynamic in their phenotype. That is non-stem cells leading to, uh, uh, you know, in, in um, dynamic equilibrium with stem cells, but this third cell state really not having a role until we treated with chemotherapy. And in these simulations, what we started to find was that there was a change in the non-stem cell population at the same time we saw a change in the new cell state. Telling us one important thing is that when we're treating with chemotherapy, it's not the stem cells, the resistant that we're thinking about when we see this residual tumor mass, it's actually a non-cancer stem cell that's driving adaptive resistance, adaptive resistance to chemotherapy. So this really is a paradigm shift in the concept of how we're going after treating cancer. So we took this information back into the lab and we built a mechanistic study to investigate what proteins are driving the survival instincts of these cells, of this new cell phenotype. And doing this mechanistically, we derived uh, the survival proteins that are involved. And that specifically in this case was a protein called HIC. And HIC is a Sark family kinase, um, largely investigated in hematologic malignancies and not really looked at in solid tumors. So this was more of a, a, a discovery moment for us. Um, and we began looking at what drugs can we develop that can target this one cell state. And after exhaustive um, uh, drug screening, uh, came across several drugs that had exquisite sensitivity in this adaptive resistant cell phenotype. And ostensibly, if we can get rid of it, then we can get rid of relapse. So now, this is all very interesting from the mechanistic perspective, but can we translate this clinically? And so what we began looking at were schedules and combinations of therapy. Obviously, chemotherapy has um, its value in treatment, but now we need to invoke kinase inhibitors in, chemo in, in, in the chemotherapy regimen so we can target this new cell phenotype. And what we know is that we can apply chemotherapies in combination in any regimen. And so what we did is we went back to computational biology and said, okay, now we know what's going on in the tumor cell, how this plasticity evolves, so can we build simulations to predict the best combinations of therapy? And what we came across was this schedule one, or uh, uh, what is ostensibly becoming to us a Goldilocks schedule, which is that we give chemotherapy at an early time point and we give the combination therapy not at the same time, so not too early, we don't give it too late in the regimen, we give it at the perfect time in this Goldilocks uh, um, uh, region of, of treatment. So we took this into mice and we said, can we translate these in silico predictions into mice? We developed in vivo breast cancer models um, in which we treated with uh, uh, control regimens, different schedules, and I'm highlighting these specifically, when we apply this Goldilocks regimen, which is not too early, not too late, not simultaneous, we achieve the best output in terms of tumor growth, the best therapeutic efficacy, and the best survival in our mice. But that's really not just enough for us. Uh, we really wanted to know if this has clinical relevance. And what we did is, in collaboration with a lab at, uh, uh, in India, uh, we worked with them to uh, uh, develop an explant model. This patient specifically came in uh, relapse stage four breast cancer in February of 2013, again, non-responsive to therapy in July, and then again, non-responsive to her second therapy in that September. And what they did is they took her tumor out and they evaluated these different regimens, and they evaluated this temporal scheduling of drugs. And what we found was something that was really extraordinary because the patient is resistant to taxanes, and this is docetaxel in this case. I have it listed as DTX. What's extraordinary is that DTX alone has no effect, but DTX in combination with this regimen, with this, this kinase inhibitor, actually reverses that resistance and overtly sensitizes the tumor to cell death or apoptosis. So with all of that, I'm just gonna close with telling you that this computational modeling, this computational biology, has helped us inform that timing the release of drugs is really penultimate to uh, finding a cure, in that we can inform better combination nanomedicines, which is something that we're pursuing now, that we've developed. We've also developed this, this idea into activatable drug conjugates, uh, sorry, drug conjugates, so basically therapeutics that are localized only to the regions that you want them at a certain time, and then, of course, targeted inhibitors. And so with that, I'll just acknowledge uh, Shiladit Sengupta, whose laboratory I was uh, bred from, 
and uh, uh, some of our collaborators, including Cornelia Polyak and, and uh, Mohamed Kwandel. And I will take your questions later, I think. All right. Fascinating how, how math can be used for such, you know, powerful new technologies in medicine. Next up, we have uh, Natalie Artsy, who is an assistant professor at the Brigham. Um, we'll be discussing, can precision nanomedicine help eradicate cancer? Good morning, everybody, and thank you. Very happy to be here today and present our work in precision nanomedicine and especially focusing on how we can use it to eradicate cancer. Innovations in materials has, have helped cre uh, create uh, composite materials and interventions that previously were unimaginable. Materials can now reinforce, sense, and report on tissue state and can treat and repair compromised tissues. And there's a lot we can do now to program materials to affect the microenvironment. But little attention has been paid to studying how the microenvironment will affect the material post-implantation, which leads to an unpredicted therapeutic outcome. My laboratory focuses on studying tissue biomaterial interactions under specific applications and scenarios in order to attain the desired therapeutic outcome. And what I'm going to focus on discussing today is on giving you a few examples of technologies we developed uh, with this notion in mind, and uh, also the rules that we came up with that we believe will help alleviate uh, and ameliorate the, the lives of patients. So this is an example of an adhesive material that we developed uh, to um, seal uh, the suture line after internal surgeries. Every year, there are 70 million uh, uh, surgically initiated wounds, and especially in the gastrointestinal tract, there is a huge problem with leakage that results in many complications that lead to high morbidity and mortality. Application of a material that will seal the suture line, coat it, and prevent leakage will save the lives of so many patients every day. However, commercially available materials are usually failing. There is a high failure rate of about 30%, and the question is why? So here you can see a, a material we developed a, a in green that we apply to different tissues. And you can see that when the same material, the same adhesive material is applied to different tissues, the, the reaction is very different. And when the material is applied to duodenum, which is part of the small intestine or the liver, the interaction here is really good. As you can see, a, a very tight interface here. And this is a result of many tissue locks or binding sites that are available to interact with material keys. When the same material is applied to the lung or the heart, as can be seen here by the large pores at the interface, the interaction is not as good because we have less tissue locks available for uh, binding with the material. That here points at the importance of quantifying and characterizing each target site in order uh, to uh, select the proper material composition for each application. Strikingly, while materials are being applied to inflamed, injured, or diseased tissues, little work has been done uh, to examine how diseased environment or local pathology affects the material. Here you can see the adhesion strength or maximum load that we measured when the material was applied to a cancerous colon or healthy colon in a rat. And you can see that the adhesion increases because we have more tissue binding sites provided by collagen. When the same material is applied to colitic tissue, we lose 50% of the adhesion of the material because of inflammation that degrades collagen, which provides the binding site to, uh, to interact with the material. If we understand the underlying biology, we can then tweak the material and change the formulation, and in that way achieve adequate adhesion in the colitic state that is now comparable to that in the healthy state. So here we basically see the notion that materials should be uh, matched with specific application, considering the target site, local pathology, and the underlying biology in order to attain the predicted outcome. So in essence, what we are suggesting is just like we study drug pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, which roughly corresponds to the effect of drug on the environment and the effect of the environment on the drug, same thing should be applied to material design, where material kinetics and material dynamics should be studied in order to design treatments that take into account personal heterogeneity and attain basically personalized treatment. Today I'm going to focus uh, uh, my talk on what we've done in the field of breast cancer. Seven years ago, my best friend was diagnosed with breast cancer. Breast cancer diagnosis is life-changing. 
She had to undergo systemic chemotherapy to shrink the tumor, surgery to remove the tumor, radiation to eradicate any leftover cells, and then another round of chemotherapy. Actually, in 2015, one in eight American women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. There will be 300,000 new cases with 40,000 women expected to die. The day that my friend was diagnosed with breast cancer, I decided that my lab will develop means to eradicate it and study this disease. So we came up with a few rules that I'm going to share with you, but it started from a simple question. Why do we treat a local tumor systemically? The drug needs to uh, go throughout the entire body in order to reach this tumor, a few centimeters in size. And we asked, can we actually leverage injectable materials, injectable scaffolds that can be doped with nanoparticles, very smart materials that can uh, provide a, a gene therapy, release drug, and do so many things, but use the same uh, approaches we use for systemic therapy, uh, immunomodulation, anti-angiogenesis, re-educating the tumor microenvironment by repolarizing uh, tumor-associated macrophages, inhibition of uh, MMPs to prevent invasion and uh, metastasis, and we can do all that in a local manner. We can actually leverage material design to sense the tissue microenvironment and report on uh, different targets and, and disease states in order to treat and reprogram the tissue. We can have materials with different sizes and shapes that can carry different cargos to probe the environment and normalize the tissue. And we can actually combine specific triggering mechanisms in order to treat the patient in a very specific manner that will be informed by the disease type and state. So we came up with three different rules. The first rule was local delivery. Here you can see a fluorescently labeled drug that was applied either systemically or in a local manner using hydrogel and smart nanoparticles to treat breast cancer tumor. And you can see the biodistribution of the drug. When applied systemically, it does reach the tumor, but also the liver and the spleen. And depending on the size of the nanoparticles and materials we are using, it can also accumulate in the kidney, in the lungs, etc. When we apply the, the drug locally, it only accumulates in the tumor. This also imparts better therapeutic outcome, as can be seen here. Here we followed uh, the tumor uh, size using luciferase assay following nanoparticle application. And you can see that when applied systemically, the tumor does shrink in the first 24 hours because the drug is still in the circulation. But then it actually uh, catches up and continues to grow. On the contrary, when we apply the drug in a local manner, you can see that it does take a little bit more time because the drug is sustained and released uh, over time, but you can see that the tumor shrinks and doesn't bounce back. Rule number two, disease selective materials. Even when applied locally, we want the drug to only affect cancer cells while sparing healthy cells. This is very important to attain the right therapeutic outcome while minimizing side effect. By treating nanoparticles with specific ligands that will react only with uh, overexpressed receptors in cancer cells, we were able to kill the cancer cells pretty significantly while sparing healthy cells. And you can see here that they continue to grow and proliferate. Rule number three, disease responsive materials. Truly personalized treatment will arise only if the materials are disease triggered. And what you can see here is a system that we developed to treat breast cancer that has a gene therapy and drug delivery at the same time. We wanted the system also to report and sense the environment and treat it at the same time. You can see here a gold nanoparticle that was uh, conjugated with the DNA sequence, DNA hairpin, that we call a nanobeacon, that was fluorescently labeled. We have a chemotherapeutic drug, 5-fluorosyl, that was intercalated in the DS DNA sequence that's also fluorescently labeled. But in this conformation, actually, in this configuration, we don't see any fluorescent signal because the fluorescence of the beacon is quenched by a quencher and the fluorescence of the drug was designed to be quenched by the gold nanoparticle. However, when the system uh, 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 senses a target, it actually becomes activated. And the nano beacon here opens up and it hybridizes with the target. And this prevents translation of this specific uh, uh, target to a protein. And it, in that way, silences a, a specific target. But now it also restores the fluorescence because of the increased distance between the fluorophores and their quenchers. 
So as you heard, chemotherapy, resistance to chemotherapy is very important because 70% of cancer patients are actually uh, showing resistance. So as a proof of concept, the DNA nanobeacon sequence that was designed here was to silence a multi-resistant protein, MRP1, in order to reverse resistance to the 5 fluorocyl chemotherapy. And by applying the hydrogel material with these specific nanoparticles, we looked at uh, two more uh, in vivo over time using luciferase assay and also the fluorescent signal of the nanobeacons. And here you can see the tumor two weeks after treatment. When we only have the hydrogel as a control, this is the tumor. Hydrogel with the 5 fluorocyl chemotherapy, also you can see the tumor continue to grow because of resistance to the drug. But when we silence the MRP1 protein using our nanobeacons, you can see that the tumor shrinks, the drug becomes active again. You can see the nanobeacon signal as it hybridized with the target. And what a beautiful result we got of 90% cancer inhibition by silencing 80% of the MRP1 protein. So we came up with three rules for primary tumor abrogation, local delivery, disease selectivity, and disease responsive materials. But the question is, what would, it, would be the ideal treatment when cancer already spread and formed metastasis? Do we now need to revert back to systemic therapy that will treat very, uh, very well the metastasis, but on the expense of suboptimal treatment of the primary tumor? So we came up with rule number four combination therapy, combination of local and systemic treatment, where we will exploit local treatment for a, a, a very effective abrogation of the primary tumor, and then a lower dose of systemic therapy that will be targeted and will attack the metastasis in an organ-specific manner. So dissecting the, um, the different properties of the tumors and their variability from one patient to the other will actually inform material design. When materials will be disease specific, we can then get personalized treatment that will impart the best uh, clinical outcomes. We have a long journey ahead of us, but actually we have access to a great scientific community facilities and technologies, and it is incumbent upon us to leverage all of those uh, to uh, impart uh, better treatments and, and utilize personalized medicine to get the best therapeutic outcomes. So nanotherapeutic materials are key to eradicating cancer, and I invite you to join me for this long journey to infinity and beyond. Thank you. Excellent. That was fantastic. So next up, we have Oren Levy, who is an instructor of medicine, uh, who will be discussing therapeutic stem cell ninjas. So good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jeff and the organizers, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. So I'm going to talk about therapeutic stem cell ninjas. And in fact, I'm going to talk about how we can use engineered stem cells to combat some of the most devastating diseases out there. <coughs> so one such disease is multiple sclerosis. It is the leading cause of neurological disability in young adults with almost half a million American patients. Now, that disease is an autoimmune disease by which the patient's own immune system attacks its brain and spinal cord. Now, that disease has no cure. And a major challenge in multiple sclerosis along with other neurodegenerative diseases, is how we can target therapeutics through the blood-brain barrier into the brain and spinal cord. Now, a similar issue of drug delivery occurs in many types of cancer, and we heard that talk by Aaron and Natalie about how challenging that is. Now, one such cancer is prostate cancer. Most common cancer and second leading cause of cancer death in American men, one in seven will be diagnosed, nearly a quarter of a million diagnosed every year, and nearly 30,000 death cases every year. And the problem with prostate cancer, very similar to breast cancer, is the metastasis. What can we do about the metastasis? It just drops survival, survival rates so drastically. So again, the problem here is the site of metastasis. Very similar to breast cancer, prostate cancer has a tendency to metastasize to bones, making it extremely painful for patients, and also making it extremely challenging to target drugs to sites of metastasis in the bone marrow while reducing adverse effects as much as we can. 
Now, we believe we can address those challenges using stem cells, adult stem cells, called mesenchymal stem cells. Those cells are readily accessible. They can be obtained from the bone marrow of any adult. They're already used in more than 500 clinical trials, and their safety is fully established. We already know we can infuse into the bloodstream of patients hundreds and millions of mesenchymal stem cells without inducing any adverse effects. And in fact, we also know that those cells have therapeutic properties. They can release anti-inflammatory agents and actually suppress the immune response in many diseases. However, when we infuse stem cells into the blood, and it could be mesenchymal stem cells or any other type of stem cells, we virtually lose control over where they're going and what they release. So in our lab, we aim to develop engineering strategies to address those questions, to better control cell fate following infusion into the patients. So we've developed multiple approaches to address that, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of those approaches today. So one approach is small molecule preconditioning, in which we simply add a drug to the cell prior to infusion, and it allows us to better control its phenotype. We also work with mRNA transfection, which is a transient form of genetic engineering, allowing us to control cell fate after infusion. And we also have an approach by which we simply dope anti-cancer drugs into stem cells, basically using the cells as the delivery vehicle to sites of metastasis. So what we're essentially trying to do is to take that cell which is cool and is safe and it has some therapeutic properties and we want to turn it into this combat ninja cell that can be at the right place at the right time, secreting the specific therapeutic payload we wanted to secrete in order to either cure multiple sclerosis or combat cancer metastasis. <coughs> so the first approach I'm going to talk about is mRNA engineering. And we're actually trying to use this approach to mimic white blood cells. When there's injury or inflammation, <coughs> White blood cells are being recruited to site of disease in order to help repair the damage. And there's a very well distinct, distinct process they do this. They're being captured from the uh, bloodstream, attached to the endothelial surface, start rolling slowly, and eventually they stop and they can migrate into the tissue. In the lab, it looks like something like that. So you can see the cells shooting in, just like the bloodstream, and eventually they're being captured, and they start rolling slowly until they stop on that surface which simulates the endothelial cells. Now also in the lab we can see how it looks with healthy versus inflamed blood vessel. If the blood vessel is healthy, white blood cells just fly by. They do not interact with the surface. But once we have inflammation, the blood vessel changes and it can actually recruit the white blood cells. So it looks like something like that. You can see the cells actually interact with the surface. They slowly roll on the surface until they adhere. Now, the problem with me uh, mesenchymal stem cells is that they lack the mechanism to do that. That's why they cannot be recruited to site of disease at high efficiency. So what we're trying to do with mRNA engineering is actually recreate that mechanism in our stem cells. So we use mRNA transfection, which is a transient form of genetic engineering, which means there's no genome integration. It's considered way safer than DNA engineering. <laughs> And by using this approach, we actually induce expression of specific proteins in the stem cells. So what we can do is we basically can decorate the cell surface so it now expresses those homing ligands that can attract it to site of disease. It's almost like we can put a zip code on the cells and shuttle them to site of disease from the bloodstream. Now, we can also control the therapeutic cargo using this approach. We can make them express anti-inflammatory agents to suppress the inflammation better. So then when we infuse the cells into the bloodstream, we're hoping to get as many cells possible getting to site of disease and releasing high levels of a therapeutic cargo. <coughs> now using this approach, for instance, we were able in a mouse model to shuttle a high number of cells to both healthy and gamma irradiated bone marrow, which could be extremely useful in targeting bone metastasis. And using this approach, we also were able to deliver anti-inflammatory cytokines to site of inflammation to suppress local inflammation in mice. Now the second approach I'm going to talk about is an approach by which we load cells with anti-cancer drugs and use the cells as delivery vehicles to take those drugs to sites of cancer. Now our vision for this particle in a cell approach 
is that we can take anti-cancer drug, encapsulate them in those polymeric micron-sized microparticles, dope cells with those microparticles. So now those cells are actually huge reservoirs of drug. Infuse the cells into the bloodstream, get a high number of cells reaching tumor site, either metastasis or the primary tumor, releasing the drug, and eventually suppressing or inhibiting tumor growth. Now the drug we're using in that project, it's called G114, was designed by our collaborators at Hopkins. And in fact, this is a prostate cancer specific drug. So it can be cleaved and activated only on site of prostate cancer, not anywhere else in the body. So that by itself reduces side effects. Now the polymer we're gonna use is PLJ, it's an FDA approved polymer. And we're gonna use our mesenchymal stem cells to deliver the drug. Now we've had some interesting progress on that project. We were able to generate our empty microparticles, but also these are the drug microparticles. You can see they're spherical around mi one micron in size. And we know they can actually release the drug to the surrounding. Now the important thing is that when we take those drug microparticles and we add them to our stem cells, it doesn't kill them, which is great because we don't want to kill our delivery guy quite yet. We may want to kill him later. Now when we look under confocal microscopy, you can see the cell membrane here in green, the microparticles in red, and you can see that the RMSCs, our stem cells, actually uptake the drug. So now they actually serve as huge reservoirs of anti-cancer drugs. And we also saw that they can release the drug to their surrounding, and then when they release it, they can kill prostate cancer cells quite efficiently. <laughs> now when we took this to tumor-bearing mice, we saw that as long as we can get high levels of drug-loaded stem cells to the tumor, they can efficiently inhibit tumor growth and also improve mouse survival. So the last approach I'm gonna talk about are small molecules. We developed this in collaboration with Sanofi, which is a big pharmaceutical company. We developed this multi-step screening platform to identify small molecules or compounds that we can simply add to the stem cells prior to infusion, allowing us to better control their behavior in the body. Now, we screened nearly 10,000 compounds, and we came up with multiple promising hits. And those hits were able to increase adhesion of stem cells to inflamed blood vessels. So we predicted that we can get more cells at site of disease. And that's exactly what we got. One of the compounds were enabled us upon injection of the stem cells into the bloodstream to get high numbers of stem cells to site of local inflammation and eventually suppress local skin inflammation in mice. And one of the compounds we identified actually significantly boosted the clinical impact in a multiple sclerosis mouse model. So just to recap, what we're basically trying to do is to develop engineering strategies to create those highly potent therapeutic stem cells that we envision can be infused into the bloodstream and we'll be able to control <coughs> exactly where those cells are going, which organs they're targeting, and what is the therapeutic payload they secrete to combat a wide array of diseases. So with that, I'm done. I want to thank Jeffrey Karp and our collaborators, mostly Frank Quintana <coughs> and John Isaacs from Hopkins, and also this talented group of young researchers contributing to those projects. And thank you all for listening. Excellent. So, so far today, we've heard about how computational approaches can be used to develop better treatments for cancer, in particular breast cancer. We've heard about how we can target biology with materials to develop better surgical techniques and also better, better treatments for cancer. We've also heard how we can harness stem cells to treat diseases such as multiple sclerosis and prostate cancer. So, you know, how could this session possibly get any better than that? Well, we have a very special guest with us today, um, Megan Skildari, uh, and she is going to describe for us how bioengineering is perceived in the media. And Megan is an award-winning freelance journalist. Um, she's a health columnist at the Boston Globe. 
Uh, she's also contributed uh, to Newsweek, Bloomberg, Scientific American, um, Discover, Nature, um, and all sorts of other um, high-impact uh, magazines, uh, and was previously a contributing editor for uh, The Scientist magazine. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Megan. Thanks. Um, well, I'll be quick so we can get some questions from our panelists about their research. Um, I, you know, this is so many thought-provoking ideas, and bioengineering, it's so cliche to say, but it is a hot topic. It is not only moving forward so quickly, this whole area of research, as we've seen by hearing from our uh, panelists, but also it really taps into the imagination of the public. Not only, as Jeff mentioned, have we all, whether we know it or not, um, had different material, bioengineered materials on or in our bodies, but um, people love this idea that uh, medical devices and therapies could become as advanced as other technologies, as the phones we all carry around in our pockets all the time that we use every day. Sometimes it feels like medicine lags behind and bioengineering sort of opens up this whole new area for that. Um, in some ways, it's kind of like the sci-fi of medicine and we know how much people love that and tap into those ideas. Um, so because of that, it's very popular uh, in media outlets. It's something that I write about regularly um, and all of our speakers today have been featured in the news. Um, Dr. Artsy's work made headlines in March. Uh, I think my favorite one was about her gold nanoparticles, gold Trojan nano horse to fight cancer. So again, it just taps into these creative ideas because bioengineering at its core is sort of this, the creative um, avenue of medicine. Um, and then Dr. Goldman uh, in the lab of Dr. Sengupta in February, their, uh, one of their papers made the press calling a one-two punch catches cancer cells. Um, and I really point out that work making the press because it's math. And how often does math make the press or the front page of the press? Never, I mean, it really, really doesn't. I have a few colleagues who write about math uh, and they really have to stretch and write about other topics because it's just not uh, very popular. But the fact that bioengineering and math together catches people's attention. Um, and uh, Jeff, certainly you can't keep him out of the news. Uh, if you've heard <laughs> over the last year uh, about uh, glue to fix a broken heart, that was all out of his lab. Uh, don't get me started on all the gecko work that has come from his lab. We, some of us couldn't even get away from that. Um, so there's never really been, for a journalist, a better time to follow a field for a researcher, a better time to innovate in a field, and as a patient, a better time to be on the receiving end of some of these therapies. Um, we're beginning to see for the first time bladders, pieces of hearts created in laboratories. There is a test on a chip for everything and anything. Um, so it's this fusion of engineering and the life sciences that we're seeing these new breakthroughs every day. Um, and you will for sure continue to see them covered in the media again, because they're so vivid uh, and so close to home for all of us. Um, so that's it, that's all I really have to say. Um, I'd like to invite our panelists to come up and sit down. Um, I, of course, could pepper them with questions all day, um, but if you have any questions, um, please feel free to raise your hands and we'll take those as well. So please join me up here. Before we get to any audience questions, I thought I'd start with something that um, Oren ended on. This idea, at the very end, you mentioned how you were screening for small molecules um, to sort of dose these mesenchymal stem cells with, which made me think about sort of all of your approaches. Why, why bioengineering over screening in general? At this point, there are so many chemicals and compounds and libraries all around the US, all around the world, that we could just screen for new therapies all the time. What are the advantages of bioengineering? Why are you all putting so much work into uh, engineering different organisms, genes, cells, stuff like that, as opposed to just screening what's already out there? Well, I think the truth is that despite having all those libraries, we still have no cure to so many devastating diseases, just like Jeff mentioned. There's no cure for cancer, no cure for multiple sclerosis, other neurodegenerative diseases. Cells, microparticles, nanoparticles, all those bioengineering engineered components can actually do a lot of things that simply molecules by themselves cannot. 
I mean, we're talking more efficient delivery to sites of cancer, like Natalie showed, and I know that Aaron is doing some work on that. We can use cells to deliver drugs more efficiently through tumor and actually penetrate better, potentially penetrating the blood-brain barrier, which is something molecules, m large molecules cannot do. So actually using st cells or microparticles or nanoparticles have many, many advantages over simply compounds. And if I could actually add to that, um, you know, it's really dose that we're able to overcome using this bioengineering. I, you can base, I mean, you could go in, you could take any of the drugs that are available now, and you could kill the tumor, but you'll kill the person. So, you know, being able to create that specificity um, in, in Oren's work and in Natalie's work, and, and certainly translated in ours, is that we're able to create a better delivery method. And by creating a better delivery method, we can increase how much dose the tumor sees versus how much dose the patient sees. Um, so that's really one major, I think, advantage to more, more, more than just the ability for these to, uh, um, to you know, be attractive uh, vehicles. They're, they're super efficient at giving us the dose that we need. And Natalie, that makes me want to ask you, um, you know, you mentioned sort of your, your first step is local delivery. Uh, maybe to others in the audience, too, to me that seems so logical. Like, why don't we just deliver all drugs right to where they're supposed to be? So has this um, been done before with any success? And if not, why? Why haven't we you know, been locally delivering drugs to different cancers, to different diseases? So I think there are two reasons for that. One is that cancer, for example, if we focus on cancer, is viewed as a systemic disease. And as a systemic disease, you, uh, you're expected to treat it systemically. And this is actually the first uh, thing I heard when I met the, the head of the breast oncologist uh, program at the Brigham. And when I told him, you know, we can basically combine local and systemic therapy when needed, but if we don't need and we don't, we, there's no risk for metastasis, we can treat it locally and it's so much if, if, more efficacious and there will be no side effects, basically. He was more open to the idea. And I think that this is one aspect. We can now also become smarter. This is the second point. I think a decade or two decades ago, material science was not that developed. So we couldn't become so smart in material design, meaning that we use drugs in a, a very sophisticated, by identifying molecular mechanisms, biological mechanisms. Now we can use the same biological mechanisms to make our delivery systems more sophisticated, more selective, triggered by a specific disease, and we can actually design a therapy, one therapy for many different patients that will be activated and will act differently from one patient to the other based on signals and cues it will get from the specific patient. So I think it's the combination of how we view diseases and now the progress in material science uh, uh, that now enable us to do things that we didn't do in the past, although it seems straightforward, I agree. Yeah, so we need a paradigm shift in how we even think about it, which has been a problem right. with cancer, I think, from the get-go. Um, any questions up in the back? You probably have to speak up. Yeah, so my question is for Aaron. Oh, we have a mic coming to you. So my question is for Aaron. Uh, so specific gene silencing in cancer stem cells is seen as one of uh, the therapeutic leads. So you are uh, saying there are the third kind of cancer stem cells they are seeing, like the, uh, they are like cancer stem cells. So do you think they are present for a time where we can do all this manipulation? Like how much time they are there? You're saying they are very transient. Yeah, I mean, right. So, you know, that's one of the things that we explore, that we're exploring now is yeah. how, how clinically, how would this be um, uh, translated where we know that we have the right time between therapies or immediately after. So this, this idea of sequence versus just inundating a patient with a combination therapy. I mean, right now you'll go into the clinic and in the case of uh, desatinib and docetaxel, it's a regimen that they use in castration-resistant prostate. And inundating a patient with desatinib at every single day, and then going in for an infusion therapy once, uh, once every two weeks. And so to change that in such a way that we can manage the combination and do the four days so that we can attack a transient phenotype, how long that phenotype is around, maybe that's patient specific. I mean, maybe that's something that can be elucidated through computational modeling with better evidence clinically. Um, all of the evidence that we have now is really from primary tumor um, explant studies, in vivo studies, in vitro studies. So, 
you know, be, being able to explore this notion clinically is going to be a, a next step. So uh, my next question is, uh, do you think these third kind of cancer stem cells, which you are proposing, can they interact with the vasculature? Like they are uh, there enough time that they can be uh, interacting with the vasculature in the tumor microenvironment? Yeah, so I mean, that's a really interesting question. So actually, I have a, I have a project um, that just finished up. I'm sure they won't mind in, uh, 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 in Texas. We're uh, just finishing up a study that I collaborated on, which is we're investigating the metastatic potential of this phenotype. And this phenotype is what they're referring to as a hybrid phenotype is um, in between a mesenchymal and an epithelial state. And it's the ep mesenchymal state that's really considered this cancer stem cell state and the epithelial state that's not. And then our third phenotype ish is in this middle ground. And it has a hugely metastatic capability in that hybrid state. And so absolutely, it's got adhesive properties, it's got metastatic potential, it's got quiescence phase where it potentiates a lot of um, uh, uh, infiltration and, and metastatic capability. And the third question is, morphologically, how these cells are different? Uh, morphologically, they're, they're unique, I think. Um, you know, in our primary tumors and in vivo and in vitro, they're very unique in that, um, I mean, morph they're, they're epithelial in nature um, at the same time that they're derived from like a mesenchymal state. So I mean, if you can imagine the, the mix in between both is morphologically, I guess, how I would describe it. <laughs> and Aaron, you found, identified these cells in breast cancer tissue, right? Do you have any evidence or hypothesize that they, they do exist in other cancer systems? No, I mean, you know, this, th this was a uh, model system that we used. Um, we've gone on since and we've investigated this in uh, um, uh, gastroesophageal cancers and pancreatic cancers, um, and it's ever present. For whatever reason, we have extraordinary um, responses in triple negative breast cancers um, that we've been working with, which is probably the best news for us because that's the most aggressive and least treatable breast cancer um, that there is. Any other questions? Um, so I'll ask for each of you to answer in return, what's, what's your next step or what needs to happen, what we all want, for this to get into humans? Aaron, you mentioned, I think, one, one patient that you've tried. Um, so for each of you, You've shown, and we've seen some very impressive mouse results, um, but we all know there's, there's this gap. Um, so are you hoping to go into humans soon, um, or what needs to happen before that? Why don't you start, Aaron, and then we'll go. Um, so I am very interested in taking compounds that we've already identified and, and taking these into a startup company. Um, so my hope is that we can do this next year. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've already been in touch with uh, um, uh, some of the clinical directors at MGH who are interested in, in developing uh, clinical trials around drugs that are already FDA approved, um, but we, we are interested in moving this into the spectrum our own very soon. Great. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I'm also very interested in transla translating those technologies uh, forward. So the base materials that we're using, different hydrogels and nanoparticles are already uh, we started a company that we, we are hoping to approve those in the next couple of years. In terms of the specific treatment, silencing of specific genes and how it works in also in triple negative breast cancer, we actually set up collaborations with uh, different people at the Brigham, the head of the breast uh, cancer oncology that will provide us with tumors from patients because as we heard, because of interpersonal heterogeneity and even within the, the tumor itself, there are so many cell types and we, we would like to see that the platform really works. In collaboration with the Viv Bregev in the Broad Institute, we are going to screen for many different genes that uh, we would like to silence, and this will inform again our material design. Mm -hmm. So there will be a lot of trial and error phase where we are going to optimize and improve these platforms uh, to account for different changes, different uh, types and severity of the diseases in order to knock down important genes and deliver drugs at the same time. Well, for us, obviously, translation is key. Um, we see this as a you know, top of our priority. I think that kind of guides the strategy that we have in terms of developing our platform. So the mesenchymal stem cell I was talking about, um, basically are already in clinical trials, more than 500. We know it's safe, so it's relatively simple to get those cells into trials because people know not worst case scenario, nothing's gonna happen to the patient. And accordingly, if you guys um, noticed, a lot of the technologies we're trying to combine with our stem cells are actually already 
FDA approved by themselves. So if you're talking about small molecules, we collaborated with a drug company to identify small molecules that can potentially be used in patients. So a combination of, the, of both shouldn't have any regulatory problems for the prostate cancer. We're using a drug that's already in clinical trials. We're using a polymer that's FDA approved. And we're already involved in a phase zero clinical trial with our collaborators at Johns Hopkins to actually use those cells and see if they can target sites of prostate cancer. So for us, translation is key, and we're doing everything we can in order to bring our technologies to patients. That's great. So optimistic. Um, with that, we're out of time. So thank you all so much for coming.